Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So here I am again in my Brigandine, and uh, this time I've got basically most of the full setup on, which will hopefully give you a better idea of um, this sort of armour, how it was actually uh, worn by the majority of kind of uh, mid-level, you know, relatively well-equipped but common uh, non-noble um, foot soldiers, infantry, in the middle to late 15th century, and in fact even into the early 16th century as well. And you'll notice now that I have a full-length uh, male shirt on, so we've got a uh, male sticking out the bottom underneath the brigandine here, which is protecting my crotch, which is always a good thing in my books. We've also, of course, now got the armpits and shoulders protected by male sleeves. Of course, as I've mentioned in previous videos, you could augment this with uh, plate on the arms as well, but we're not going to look at that for now. Uh, the brigandine's over the top of the male shirt, so, you know, I've got a fair amount of weight now because the male shirt itself wears, weighs a fair amount, and I've got the brigandine over the top of that. But this does provide a very complete level of protection, and really quite a hell of a lot of protection for someone who may be a crossbowman, an archer, a billman, a pikeman, halberdier, something like this. And of course, you're going to have your sidearms as well. In this case, I've got a lang mess up just because it was the first thing to hand. And you'll usually have some form of military dagger, such as a rondel dagger or a bollock dagger, or something like this, maybe a basilard in some cases in some parts of Europe, uh, Switzerland, for example. Um, so you're going to have a dagger and a knife, and then you're going to have your main weapon, whatever that might be. Someone equipped like this might have a, an early form of firearm, a type of handgun, um, essentially a, uh, a type of early musket, in fact, various forms they came in. Or uh, someone like this might be equipped with a, a, a bill or a halberd, some type of pole weapon. Or, of course, a missile weapon, uh, a muscle operated missile weapon such as a, a bow or a crossbow. Um, or, in some cases, they might have other specialised weapons like large two handed swords or um, even grenades. Grenades were a thing, usually made in a clay pot. Um, pole axes, things like this, flail, all sorts. Um, but this is a kind of well equipped level of armour. Um, as kind of average, well-equipped level of armour. For an average infantryman of the end of the Hundred Years' War, beginning the Wars of the Roses, in a sort of Anglo-French context, um, and going all the way up, really, to kind of, um, I suppose, nearly Henry VIII's time, but the first quarter, at least, of the 16th century. Now, if you haven't seen it already, I have done a previous video talking about brigandines, and, and I do recommend you go and have a look at that, because I covered quite a lot of material in there, which I'm going to try not to repeat here. But there are some things which came up in the comments after that video and that have come up in recent discussions with other people talking about this type of armour, people talking in comments, for example, on the Facebook page for 15th Century Armour, um, and under, under other people's videos, other people who've been looking at uh, brigandines as well. Um, and I understand that there's going to be some tests done on brigandines soon. And basically there are some other points that I'd like to make in addition. So see this is an appendix to the other video which I think are very important points, which I either didn't really make uh, or I only just briefly touched on, or I didn't make them at all in the previous video, but I think that they're very important for you to know if you want to have a good understanding about this type of armour. First of all, I'm going to strip this helmet off. Right, because I can hear myself better now. And as I've um, spoken about in previous videos, obviously, anything you put on um, in terms of armour or clothing or anything like this, is going to have effects on how you operate, how you fight, how you do everything. And the fact is that this might look like, compared to full plate harness, this might look like light armour. And I suppose in a medieval context it kind of is. But it's not in weight terms particularly light. A brigandine, this is one of the points that came up, a brigandine is not necessarily lighter, or at least not a lot lighter, than a plate cuirass. Yes, it is more flexible, and that comes at a cost. Uh, so one of the great things about a uh, plate cuirass, which we've looked at in previous videos and we'll certainly look at again in the future, is that a plate cuirass is um, like, a, like a tortoise's shell. It offers you quite a lot of rigid protection. For example, if you were jousting or just in warfare on horseback and being hit by things like lances, or indeed on foot being hit by things like pole axes, you will have a lot more rigid, solid defence with something like a plate cuirass on than you will do with a brigandine. But obviously the advantage of the brigandine is it's a bit more flexible, it's easier to get on, or quicker to get on, for most people anyway, 
but I'll talk about that in a second because that's a kind of separate point. Um, and it's just generally a bit more a bit more convenient. Now, some people, so Zachary, Zachary Evans, Zach Evans uh, of the jousting group Destria, who has his own uh, channel talking mostly about armour um, and jousting and horsemanship and stuff, he does. Uh, he made a point that he he finds that his uh, plate cuirass is more comfortable than the brigandine and. I think that maybe sometimes this is the case. There are certain types of plate cuirass if they're very well fitted, um, they can take the weight very well. If you have a brigandine that maybe isn't that well fitted to you or does just for some reason doesn't work that well, you could end up in a situation where your plate cuirass is actually nicer to wear than your brigandine. But this is an overlap situation and I think it's fair to say that most people accept in the armour world, most people accept that on average a brigandine is usually more flexible, more comfortable than a plate cuirass is. That's one of the reasons why you know people bothered wearing them instead of just going straight to a plate cuirass. There is also the question of expense and that's something I didn't really touch on in my previous video and I think it's fair to say that the uh, plate cuirass has to be made to you or at least has to be made for someone extremely close in statistics to you. The brigandine is more forgiving in size and shape and fit and can be tightened more easily and this kind of stuff. So um, I think that uh, from that sense and also from the material it's made of, it's made of lots of small iron plates and I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in a second, um, but because it's made of lots of small iron plates it is uh, generally, not always, but it's generally a cheaper, more affordable product. Again, there's overlap in that. There were very high status brigandines and there were old battered old second hand cuirasses going around. So, you know, there would have been overlap. You could have got a cheap one of one version and you could have got an expensive version of another. But generally speaking, if you're talking about an average quality, newly made product in the 15th century, I think the evidence suggests that generally speaking, brigandines were cheaper than a, than a cuirass, but that wasn't always the case. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the strength of these and also some details about their construction. So one of the first points I want to make is I have uh, listed one of the virtues or advantages of brigandines in the past as being the fact that you can put them on yourself. And one of the reasons you can do this is they join at the front, uh, which you don't usually find is the case with any type of plate cuirass. Um, so you require servants or squires, assistants, to help you put on a plate cuirass and full, certainly full plate harness because there are certain things that need to be pointed you can't do yourself. Whereas a brigandine, as a common soldier, you can throw on a mail shirt yourself, you can throw on a brigandine and a helmet yourself and you don't need anyone to help you. In some situations it might be advantageous if you do have someone to help you but you don't need it. That point can be overstated for one simple fact and that is not all brigandines join at the front like mine here does and this is based on an example in uh, the Royal Armouries and um, a lot of them do okay so a lot of brigandines do join at the front like this but not all of them do. Some brigandines join at the side like a plate Kiras does and they have a uh, solid front. Sometimes they even have a small breastplate in here and for anyone who doesn't know, we'll look at the inside of this in a, in a little bit um, further along in this video, but there are two large plates here. So this, breast, this um, chest of this brigandine actually kind of almost has a breastplate and some of the ones that would more commonly be called, certainly if we go to the late 14th, early 15th century, a corazina, which is a relative, should we say, of both the plate cuirass and the brigandine, actually often connect at the side and um, have a solid breast. But there is yet another form which actually joins down the middle of the back. And now obviously if something joins down the middle of the back, you can't do it up yourself, you require servants and so on and so forth. Now as I mentioned uh, in my previous video, the evolution, development, the history, the background of the brigandine is somewhat complicated. Uh, it's not fully understood. Um, we don't have a lot of source material to go on. We've got art, we've got some surviving archaeological stuff, we've got some written texts. But it's very clear that it comes from and is related to the coat of plates. But the coat of plates also led to the full plate harness that uh, knights and uh, you know um, heavily armoured men wore by the 15th century. Um, in fact, by the end of the 14th century. And um, 
therefore there are different designs and the coat of plates comes in many different designs and if we just look at the Battle of Visby for example uh, in Gotland 1361 mass graves we had a bunch of coat of plates from there they are different constructions and they're numbered and codified by a guy called Bengt Thordeman who wrote the the book I think in 1939 on those finds you can see that there are a, diff a bunch of different coat of plates designs and some of those clearly were the precursors to brigandines some of those were the precursors to later forms of corazina and um, kind of cuirass so um, it's clear that we have different construction forms and if we look even if we go to the middle of the 15th century or the late 15th century say between 1440 50 and right the way through to the end of the 15th century 1500 um, then we see that there are a whole range of different brigandine constructions they are not only made in one way they are not made joining in one way joining at the same points and we even see different sizes and shapes i talked about the dome of the chest i want to make one point uh, reiterate one point as well clarify one point and that is that not all of them have this this shape there are surviving examples and there are artistic examples where some of them have quite a flat front uh, so not all of them have this this rounded pigeon breasted front which does seem to have been quite fashionable for the period for doublets and of course for breastplates but not all brigandines were rounded like that although there is some defensive advantage to having a rounded chest like that so there were many different types of brigandines uh, in terms of how they were arranged now the next point i want to make is there were very different rivet arrangements and patterns some brigandines are only consisting of small plates some brigandines have larger plates like this one like this leads one with two large plates kind of over the lungs combined with small plates everywhere else uh, and that's obviously sort of related to the coat of plates, the earlier coat of plates. Um, but in addition, the rivet patterns, therefore, because the plates underneath are in different arrangements and different patterns, the rivets on the outside can look very different because they can be arranged differently. And sometimes you find the little plates have only, you know, two or three rivets in them. Sometimes they have lots of rivets. And it's very, very clear that on some brigandines, they put an excessive number of rivets in and sometimes very small rivets, but more of them to give a certain appearance and to give a certain look. So it's very clear that they weren't only thinking about uh, practicality they were also thinking about aesthetic and I talked about uh, recently why the plates are worn on the inside and the fabric on the outside and I think it must be the case based on the evidence we have available that to some extent having the fabric on the outside was seen as a, a, an, a, an aesthetically pleasing a nice thing and we know about covered breastplates there were in many cases in art and we do have a few surviving where we have a solid steel breastplate of one piece that is covered with a nice fabric like velvet for example and sometimes with uh, patterns of rivets in so to secure the material to the outside of the breastplate we see this with the corazina as well um, one of the most famous ones is the St George statue in Prague which is a copy of in the Victoria and Albert Museum which I know quite well um, and it's very clear that the rivets had a decorative purpose as well as a functional purpose now these rivets as well as being of different sizes of different numbers in different patterns could also be made of different materials now while on this one it's quite utilitarian and steel um, a lot of the rivets originally would have been iron but many of the rivets were on original examples were of a copper alloy what we commonly today call bronze or well we might call it copper alloy or latin as it was sometimes referred to or brass is a roughly equivalent um, alloy as well so copper alloy rivets and they have some advantages number one they look fancy they can be gilded more easily as well um, but they look fancy um, and nice contrasting color um, but also they don't rust okay now they are slightly less strong if you make a rivet of, of brass or bronze it's not as strong as a steel rivet that's pretty much an, uh, a fact um, but that being said if you're dealing with lots of rivets maybe thousands of them in some cases it's easier to rivet lots of brass or bronze rivets because it's a softer metal than lots of iron or steel rivets so they're easier to put in they don't rust 
Um, they might be a little bit more, more forgiving in some situations. They might have a little bit more give in them rather than uh, potentially snapping like a steel rivet might. But that's just uh, theory, that's supposition. Might not be the case. Um, but the main thing is they look fancy and they don't rust. I think that's very, very important. Um, so the rivets could vary in all sorts of ways and they didn't all look like this one. Now, I'm actually going to start uh, stripping off for you um, so that we can have a little look at the inside of this um, brigandine because we're going to talk about the internals but specifically the plates that are inside this um, brig because there's quite a lot of um, variation in the surviving examples but there's also some consistency as well um, and in some ways my brigandine here is not necessarily typical of the uh, historically surviving ones. Right, now that I've got my brigandine und undone and replaced my uh, mic, uh, we can have a look at the inside of it. And what I want to talk about most is the um, material and the way that they're treated of these plates on the inside. So you'll notice now that I've got a male shirt underneath my uh, brigandine. So when we're talking about compromising, both in fact wearing this type of armor, so we are thinking about the weight and weight distribution, but when you're thinking about testing it or compromising it, you've got to consider that you've got something, uh, a plate armor basically, something akin to a breastplate on the outside, then you've got a nail shirt, then you've got a form of um, arming jacket underneath. Um, and that's quite a lot to get through. Now not to say of course that um, things like uh, war bows and uh, crossbows and stuff couldn't, couldn't bypass that because quite possibly they could. However, even if they do, it's going to reduce penetration and increase your chances of survival. When we come to hand weapons, well as you guys know, I've got a fair, fairly good idea of what it's physically possible to stick certain types of hand weapons through. And I've got to say that when you're dealing with something that's full of steel plates like this over a riveted mouth shirt over a uh, arming doublet, that's, that's quite a lot to get through. And that basically means that even a common soldier wearing this type of equipment has a very, very high level of protection on them. Um, again, I'll be very interested to see what tests against these do, but we have to add uh, a kind of a caveat to any tests against brigandines. And that is that it depends very much on the construction of the brigandine. Now, my brigandine here, I'm very lucky, um, I would stand the slightly highest chance of survival on a medieval battlefield thanks to my brigandine, because my brigandine is made of hardened steel plates. Um, now, something I have noticed is that a lot of brigandine replicas use mild steel plates, um, and some of them are tinned. Now, let's talk about that tinning for a second. So I went away and did a little bit of research, and it does seem that actually, statistically, of the brigandines that survive, quite a few of them, uh, quite a large percentage of them rather, are tinned, the plates on the inside. Now, what does that mean, tinned? Well, for those of you who don't know, tin is a metal, uh, and tin doesn't rust, whereas steel and iron do rust. So quite simply, it's like galvanized steel. Um, it's plating, essentially. So if you can tin plate steel plates, it means that it won't rust, or at least it won't rust as easily. If you damage the tinning on the outside, then rust can get in, uh, and that does happen, and we do find that on the originals. Uh, tinning can flake off, it can, it can crack, this kind of stuff. Um, but, however, these steel plates are very, very prone to rusting. Now, a number of you asked about the, the dangers. How did they stop this stuff from rusting? And the answer is, we don't know, other than tin plating. Now, on my brigandine, whilst I have hardened steel plates, which is great for being stabbed proof, um, I do have some issues with rusting. These are steel um, rivets. Those steel rivets can rust. This is fabric on the outside that's not waterproof, it's wool. That can absorb water and that will cause rust on the surface of the plates that's in contact with that wool and it will keep rusting, it will leach through, it will ruin the fabric on the outside as the rusting from the rivets will do. On the inside, if I, although this is against, it's, I've got an arming jacket and then I've got a mail shirt and then I've got metal against metal, so actually on the inside on that surface, it's relatively unlikely that I'm going to get much rusting on there from like my sweat, for example, because the sweat will be mostly wicked off or so, uh, kind of soaked up by my um, arming doublet. But 
That being the case, if I'm being rained on, if I'm campaigning in autumn or winter or just it's raining, um, or I have to wade through a river, for example, then absolutely I could get rusting on the inside of there as well. If you tin the plates, the plates for the most part are not going to rust, although you have to remember if you're wearing it over a male shirt, the male shirt friction might damage the tinning and you might get some rust, but it's certainly going to massively reduce the rust issue that you have on the inside of these plates. Additionally, if you have rivets that are made of bronze, well, that's not going to rust. So you've now what you've done is if you've tin plated the plates um, and you have brass rivet or bronze rivets, then you basically made a brigandine that is more or less rust proof. Certainly for the period, it's about as rust proof as you're going to get, which is a great thing. It means your brigandine will stay presentable for longer, will function for longer, will last for longer. And maybe if you want to sell it one day, you'll be able to sell it instead of a rusty brigandine, which you won't be able to. Um, but there, it does come at a cost using um, the, the uh, looking at the historical plates. I'm just going to put the brigandine down for a minute because oh, it's fairly heavy. Um, it does come at a cost when we look at the original ones, um, they, most of the plates are described as iron. Now, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a large-scale metallurgical study done on the, on the uh, metallurgy, basically, the, the consistency of the plates in surviving brigandines. Um, they are described as iron uh, because we can tell it's a ferrous metal, we can tell it's rusty. Um, some of them are tinned, some of them have traces of tinning, some of them don't have any tinning, has to be said, or at least none left, none visible. Um, but they are always described as iron rather than steel. Now we do know that later, uh, in the 16th century for example, that sometimes jacks of plate, which are sort of related, they're different to brigandines, but they're a bit related, they sometimes used plates from cut up plate armour, for example breastplates. Um, and when you do that, it sometimes means that the plates inside your jacker plates can be made of really quite good quality steel, you know, hardened steel. As far as I'm aware, in 15th century brigandines, the plates are made of iron, which means that they are softer. Now, this is where we come to testing. So obviously we've got the mail shirt, although it has to be admitted, and this is another problem with modern testing, mail shirts made today are mostly made in India, there's some made in uh, parts of Europe and uh, all around the world, but most mail shirts that you can commercially buy are made of mild steel. Mild steel is stronger than iron, and whilst there were steel ringed mail shirts in period, most mail probably would have been made of wrought iron, lower carbon content, a bit more ductile, a bit more flexible, less likely to break, uh, but uh, more likely to bend. Um, so I, I'm not saying whether this is a positive or a negative, but rather it's a problem with testing. It's a negative when we come to modern testing because it's difficult to get modern mail that exactly is an analogue for medieval mail. That's the first problem. Secondly, we've got the issue of what was worn underneath, and it really makes a big difference. Are we talking about layers of linen? Are we talking about something that's stuffed? Are we just talking about a light doublet? We don't really know, and it probably varied. You probably got every end of the spectrum. So when we're doing testing, we've got problems with the garment that's worn underneath, a lot of unknowns. We've got problems with the mail, because most modern mail is not completely accurate when it comes to destructive testing compared to modern made mail. And finally, we've got that problem with the brigandine, that a brigandine with iron plates is clearly going to be easier to penetrate than a brigandine with steel plates, and even uh, would even be harder to penetrate one with tempered st hardened steel plates like mine has got here. And uh, we do know, um, due to a, uh, some source material which I'll talk about in another video, that some brigandines were proofed, that is tested, with crossbows um, and, and potentially other bows. And that is quite an eye-opener because it means that they were making brigandines to different standards and different qualities, much like breastplates, and that the best ones were weapon tested against some of the most powerful weapons of the day. So that implies, given that there's a variation in quality of brigandines, that within the 15th century you might find brigandines, some of which had iron plates, some of which maybe had thicker or thinner iron plates, because of course if you're making a brigandine you can save money by using less iron by making the plates thinner. So there might be thicker plates, and some of them might have been steel plates, and some of them might have been hardened steel plates. And that's not even considering the fabric that these are built with as well, the use of uh, wool, canvas, potentially leather, and these are all variables. So testing this kind of stuff is 
fraught uh, with difficulty, in fact, because every layer of this material has so many variables to it. So I hope that's been interesting. The brigandine, there's a lot to be said about brigandines. They're a fascinating and understudied uh, type of armour. Um, and hugely interesting and not just a sort of like common soldier's armor not just a you know poor person's armor they could be extremely expensive and not just a weaker type of armor they could be proof against crossbows in some cases so i think brigandines deserve a lot more respect and recognition and study and more people wearing them and testing them and you know fighting in them than they currently get i think Thanks to uh, modern living history and uh, other forms of reenactment, they are getting more attention now, certainly than they did 20 years ago. There are some great makers of brigandines out there. Some people are tinning the plates like it was done originally. Some people are using hardened steel. Some people are using mild steel, which gives us some variation when it comes to testing. Um, and, you know, more and more people are being exposed to this type of armour, including, of course, all of you now watching uh, these videos, not just mine, but Shad's and other people who've been looking at this type of armour recently. So I hope this has been interesting. Uh, throw more questions at me because I'm sure there's a lot more to be asked and answered about brigandines and potentially tested. I'm really looking forward to Todd's um, tests on uh, brigandine analogue and mail and padding and everything else. I think it's a complicated test to do because you've got many layers of pr parameter unlike uh, just steel plate, for example, uh, but it's very worthwhile doing and I'm very uh, looking forward to seeing that. So I hope this has been useful. Give us a like and a subscribe. I'll see you really soon again on Scholar Gladiator channel. Take care, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.